his victories over the French in the course of the wars of Spanish succession, Queen Anne, 1702 to 1714, rewarded her loyal general John Churchill, the first Duke of Marlborough, with the gift of Woodstock Park. Painter Godfrey Neller recorded Churchill as a sensitive statesman, one who bore the weight of a variety of responsibilities entrusted to him, perhaps more than any other soldier in English history. From 1704, together with architect John Vanbrugh and his assistant Nicholas Hawksmoor, the Duke began building Blenheim Palace. The West Front, completed between 1705 and 1720, has all the characteristics of the Baroque style. Grand Manor, movement in architecture, Italianate balustrading to the perimeter of the roof with flanking pavilions, a piano nobile or noble first floor accessed by a grand flight of stairs, the use of giant classical columns, half columns or pilasters, and a dome over the central salon. The lower ranks within the human hierarchy were now in respectful service of their superiors. They were housed in the basement or subordinate wings. They waited in the huge entrance hall to be summoned. It wasn't designed for comfort, but intimidation. It was meant to remind you of your place or station in life. Any visitor or petitioner spending time there would reflect on what was to come, either with an arousing sense of expectation or alarmed at being placed at a distinct disadvantage when being greeted by the Duke. The decoration of the ceiling in the hall was painted in 1716 by Sir James Thornhill and it depicts the Duke of Marlborough kneeling before Britannia, the deity who in pagan times represented the islands surrounding the ancient Isle of Albion, or Great Britain. Thornhill was later dismissed in favour of the French Huguenot painter Louis Le Gueux, because the Duchess suspected him of charging just the same price for trophies painted en grisaille or in shades of grey as against using colour. On the main door of the hall, an intricate lock bears the Marlborough arms and a great key is crowned by a ducal coronet. The enfilade impresses by its length, diminishing perspective and long vista. The workmanship is amazingly accurate. It is possible to look through the keyholes of 10 doors in a row and see daylight at the end, more than 300 feet away. As in France, the enfilade was disposed along the window façade, overlooking a prospect of the gardens below. Each room was a link in the chain, the eye engaged by spatial effects and feelings exploited by decorative means. As you progressed from room to room, you could feel the power and understand the wealth and influence of the occupant. Nicholas Hawksmoor designed the marble door cases, which were carved by Grinling Gibbons. Louis Le Gueux, 1663 to 1721, painted the murals that decorated the ceiling and walls of the central salon above the wainscoting, which is made of real marble, supporting a deep base simulated to resemble other different marbles. The columns are imitation marble too, and they have swags in the panels. The numerous figures looking into the room include the painter's self-portrait and represent the four continents. The rooms of state extend from this point to either side, and the kitchen is a quarter of a mile away. It was not long before a charming poem by Jonathan Swift of Blenheim was predicting that times and attitudes were changing. The spacious court, the colonnade, and mind how wide the hall is made. The chimneys are so well designed, they never smoke in any wind. 
the galleries contrive for walking, the windows to retire and talk in, the council chamber to debate, and all the rest are rooms of state. Thanks, sir, cried I. Tis very fine, but where do you sleep or where do you dine? I find by all you have been telling that tis a house, but not a dwelling. Lenham was a palace for a national hero. Every element in Banborough's plan had a purpose. Although Marlborough's memory was somewhat later eclipsed by the Duke of Wellington a century later, his victories on the continent were the glory of Queen Anne's reign. With her death in 1714 and Louis XIV's death in France in 1715, the stage was set for a new era in Europe. Philosophers now believe the universe was a harmonious, stable place, and that if humans behave rationally and sociably, as nature intended, then conflict could be resolved and stability increased. In England, the formation of a stable government was assured. Power now had a broader base. Land ownership formed a pyramid from the aristocracy down to the smallest yeoman farmer, forming roughly three classes, the peers, the gentry and the freeholders. England was now a great power abroad and in such a climate people were increasingly aware of the world around them. Naturalists were collecting and classifying plants and animals, geologists were mapping the earth's crust and a reckless search for truth had begun, ensuring a greater awareness and understanding of natural sciences. Royal favour was no longer the only way of obtaining land and wealth as in the past. The route now lay in achieving success in a military career, the law and in trade. The upper classes and landed gentry wished to further develop their houses to impress their supporters and connections. They wanted to establish themselves and members of their families as leaders politically for purposes of status and to be seen as arbiters of style and taste. The principles of constitutional liberty and religious toleration were seen by the voting majority to be represented by one political party, the Whigs. They wanted to see the King's powers further circumscribed. They believed England should be ruled by Parliament, whose role as they saw it was to represent property owners, large and small, not the entire country. The Whigs did believe that power brought responsibilities and they spent much of their life in public service and taking care of their tenants and dependents. What they did do was simply reason that as they owned most of the land, it was only right they should have most of the power. And so began what has been called the rule of taste. The Whigs placed their own king on the throne in 1714. He was a Hanoverian and a great-grandson of James I. King George I, 1660-1727, was in his time described as a frog-eyed, corpulent, unpleasant little man of 54 with little or no interest in the arts. George didn't speak English. He had divorced his wife in 1694 and locked her up for the rest of her life in the fortress castle of Darlin. Hated by his son, Prince George Augustus, later George II, George I became a subject of ridicule by Tory pamphleteers. They warned of the pernicious effect the new monarch would have. Behold, he comes to make thy people groan, and with their curses to ascend the throne, a clodpate base in human jealous fool, the jest of Europe and the faction's tool. The elegant Georgian era, 1714 to 1830, was named for the first four English kings named George. It would be dominated in architecture by classicism. The rising Whig gentry rejected the creations of Vanbrugh, Hawksmoor and Wren as manifestations of Tory wealth, power and extravagance. To the new man of classical taste, these vast piles were a sign of decadence and a deviation from the classical truth. 
Blenheim or the similarly imposing Castle Howard were far too grandiose now to suit the rustic associations at the agricultural heart of an Italian villa. The word villa, deriving from Latin, had been translated into Italian and then absorbed into the English language during the 17th century when architect Inigo Jones had worked on the Queen's House at Greenwich. The idea of a smaller, more compact type of house in which privacy, convenience and elegance were now far more important than parade and magnificence would become desired by all men of power and perception who were busy studying the ancient past. New ideas were challenged and debated amongst members of the Kit Kat Club, whose name derived from Christopher Cat, their cook. A select coterie of dilettante, they assembled regularly at the fountain in the Strand to dine, exchange views and propose suitable toasts to exalted beauties and life. All members were influenced by essays on a variety of subjects and their own grand tour of the continent, where they had observed idealised landscapes painted by Italian-trained French artist Claude Gelet, also known as Claude Lorraine, 1600 to 1682. Claude blended architecture and nature together in a pictorial effect that all new men of substance wanted to capture in the architectural composition and settings for their own remodelled country houses. They now admired buildings not merely as architecture, but for the fearful thoughts or pleasurable feelings that they inspired. This vision or idea became known as the cult of the picturesque, and it was debated well into the 19th century. The Palladian movement in England was launched by a series of literary exaltations. Lord Shaftesbury, in his letter on taste in 1712, praised the works of Italy's architect Andrea Palladio and England's Inigo Jones, while condemning the works of mathematician Sir Christopher Wren. Architectural style became bound up in politics, and in 1715 two publications had a profound effect on the future of English design and style. The first was an English translation of Andrea Palladio's I Quattro Libra della Architettura with copper plate engravings by Giacomo Leone, who improved on Palladio's originals. The second was a publication by Scottish architect Colin Campbell, 1676 to 1729, of the very first volume of his work, Vitruvius Britannicus. Campbell was a man on a mission, ambitious and concerned with the professional treatment of architecture. In his book, he presented illustrations of classically inspired buildings in Britain from the 17th and early 18th centuries, such as Inigo Jones' Banqueting House. He also included his own designs for Wanstead House in Essex, which was built for banker Richard Child. Wanstead, later demolished, became the synthesis for the establishment of a quintessential English country house. The Palladian style of architecture represented the Whigs' aims and ideals. The style set a pattern for design and decoration of English houses for several decades. Although externally it was simpler on the whole, its interiors remained rich and ponderous, much more suited to the grand manner of the previous grand Baroque style. The handsome carpet in a painting of Wanstead's main reception room, that remains, reveals it is likely to be needlework, as no large pile carpets were being woven in England at this time. The window's curtains were divided and the splendid tea table's wooden frame covered with sterling silver sheeting. In 1715, Richard Boyle, the third Earl of Burlington, returned home from his grand tour in April, just in time for his 21st birthday. 
he brought 878 pieces of luggage containing numerous treasures of paintings, statues, objects of virtue, bar reliefs, a marble table, porphyry vases and 12 miniatures, not to mention the set of silver dessert baskets from Paris, books and 14 pairs of gloves. On arrival, he learned of Campbell's Vitruvius Britannicus, which set standards for classical architecture he was determined to do a dress for himself. He returned to Italy in 1719 with the specific intention of studying the 16th century Venetian architect Andrea Palladio's work first hand. In the process he acquired the master's drawings of Roman antiquity. He met a young English painter by the name of William Kent, the sculptor Giovanni Battista Guelphi and the violinist Pietro Castrucci who had played in Handel's orchestra. He took them all back to England with him where he financed publication of the second volume of Vitruvius Britannicus. As well, he published Palladio's Antiquities de Roma, ensuring his own influence on the future of style and taste. Palladio's travel guide became influential as so many British grand tourists such as Borel used and recommended it. Celebrity patronage worked just as well then as it does now. The Earl of Burlington established a minimum standard of excellence one that would persist right throughout the Georgian era. He employed architect Colin Campbell, together with painter-designer William Kent, to imagine Chiswick Villa, a pleasure pavilion he wanted to build to entertain his friends in the countryside outside London. Inspired by Palladio's La Rotunda or Villa Capra in the Veneto, instead of four identical facades, it only had one, which housed the main entrance. Chiswick abounded in classical references as Burlington admired Palladio's version of architecture, which he saw as combining classical authority, dignity and comfort. The columns of the portico were copied from those adorning the ancient temple of Castor and Pollux at Naples, which Burlington had seen and Palladio had drawn. The steps and loggia had fat stone balusters and incorporated sculpture. Of significant importance at Chiswick was the use of a half-circle shaped window that gained its name Diocletian because it had been originally found in the ancient ruins of the baths of the Emperor Diocletian at Rome. Palladio also used what is now called a Venetian window, whose arrangement of three lights had the centre one wider than a flanking pair, and whose arched head sprang from the architrave of the other two. The Venetian window became one of the most enduring characteristics of the Palladian style all over England. Burlington also used a bizarre form of chimney stack, never seen in Britain before, which recalled the shape of strange obelisks they had all seen at Rome, not knowing that they were originally from ancient Egypt. The idea for the shallow dome surmounting the central salon was borrowed from the architecture of the ancient Roman pantheon. Palladio had not illustrated interiors in his Quattro Libra, partly because the decoration of his best known villas was assigned to fresco painters, who in the main preferred a vocabulary far more elaborate than his own. The interior decoration at Chiswick shows off William Kent's Italian Baroque style training with richly carved swags, ribbons, putty, mirrors, medallions, which are often gilded. The Palladian preference was for simple, bold colours, not the pallid pastel shades so often associated with the early Georgians. In the blue velvet room, the colour Prussian blue was made from a pigment invented in Germany in 1704. It was just being introduced into Britain in the 1720s, at which time it still remained prohibitively expensive, as was gold leaf. So they were both important status symbols. The principal guide for an early 18th century decorator was John Smith's The Art of Painting, published in 1687 with editions in 1705, 1723 and 1753. 
they highlighted darker wood colours and striking tones of pea green, sky blue and straw yellow. Paint pigments varied enormously and chocolate brown was very popular for internal joinery. Oil paints were based on white lead and stone colours varied from an off-white to resemble pale Portland stone to a yellowish brown. In smaller homes, green was frequently used for joinery both inside and out. Brilliant whites did not exist. They are a late 19th century invention and are in completely inappropriate for restoring Georgian style homes. Designer William Kent became the crucial intermediary between the older traditions of largely Italianate forms of gardens that had been put in place at the turn of the century and the emergence of a new genre, one that would be seen as entirely English, the English landscape style. Kent worked as an architect, interior decorator, furniture and landscape designer with considerable success in each field. He was a prime example of a persistent phenomenon of the time, the Englishman whose visit to Italy affected his life forever after. When he came to design English estates, he would recall the example of Italy, the prime context for his landscape work. One of his apprentices was a young Capability Brown. In the 20th century historian Alan Gore's own words, Kent leapt the fence and saw that all nature was a garden. He felt the delicious contrast of hill and valley, changing imperceptibly into each other. Tasted the beauty of the gentle swell or concave scoop and remarked, how loose groves crowned an easy eminence with happy ornament. And now it's time for us to take a break until part two of the Palladians versus the Goths.